Hello, everyone. My name is David Jost. I'm Chief Marketing Officer for Reva. I want to welcome you to our exclusive panel workshop today, Building Successful Fundraising Campaigns, Putting the Who, What, Where, and How into Action. We have a really good session for you today, and we're going to go ahead and get started, and uh, we're going to move ahead to do a little bit of a review of the agenda and what's in store. This is really kind of an overview for you, so you know where we're headed. First off, we're going to be doing a, a, an official welcome, and we're going to be doing some introductions of our panelists today. But uh, after, just before that, or just after that, we're going to want to hear from you. We're going to share with you a really exciting and really successful story uh, from the Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater Salt Lake. We're going to talk about building your campaign, giving you some step-by-step -step guidance. We're also going to just really show you how you can do this and how you can build your campaign, leveraging your donor relationship management platform. We'll give you some overview of software and services that'll be helpful, and we'll have some Q&A for you as well. So kind of your usual fare, but not your usual fare. This is going to be really a tremendous session. I'm going to go ahead and uh, move us ahead to the introductions and uh, let you know, again, I'm David Jost, Chief Marketing Officer of uh, Arriva. Today, I am the moderator. That will be my role. Uh, the, our guests of honor here are Amanda Hughes, who is the President and CEO of Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater Salt Lake. I'm very honored to have Amanda with us. She is a, has a tremendous uh, amount of information, some great successes uh, in working not just with the Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater Salt Lake in her uh, current role, but has a history of, uh, of working in the nonprofit space. So I'm going to just turn it over to Amanda. Thank you for joining us. If you can give us a little bit of a background, and then yeah. we'll move on to Chris. Thanks, David. Uh, I'm happy to be here, and I appreciate you inviting me to join you guys today. Uh, yeah, so my background started, I don't know how many decades ago now, I don't want to date myself too long, but, uh, but uh, in arts marketing and fundraising, I uh, worked as a professional fundraiser in, in the arts industry, mostly in the Southeast, um, and, and for some theaters and uh, museums and, and whatnot, and had an opportunity to move back home and landed at the Boys and Girls Clubs as director of development there uh, about in 2010 and so worked in in fundraising here in salt lake for for a number of years and then a few years ago moved into a consulting role um, and worked in the pacific and southwest regions primarily consulting with other boys and girls clubs on fundraising uh, as well as um, uh, board development engagement um, long-term sustainability revenue diversification um, donor engagement uh, stewardship, multiple um, events. Uh, I've done many, many special events in, in the last 20 some odd years, uh, so had some experience in that. And then uh, the, just a shortly, uh, I guess it was March, April of, of this year, um, uh, came back to Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater Salt Lake to assume the role of president and CEO from, from my predecessor, um, who'd been here for a long time. And, uh, that's where I landed and jumped into an immediate campaign. And I'll share more about that as we get going, but that's a little bit about my history and background. Well, thank you, Amanda. Uh, you know, some terrific uh, experience uh, being in the shoes of many of those who have joined us and also in working to help many in those types of positions with just exactly what we're looking at today. Uh, Amanda is joined today by Chris Fink, who is the chief operating officer, also the ch really the chief client success officer here at Ariva and uh, Chris, again, I, I guess I kind of hesitate to say decades of experience, but I'll say it, decades of experience in the space and uh, let you share a little bit about your background as well. Yeah, I know, thanks for dating me a little bit there, David. Yeah, uh, and thanks for, for having me, Amanda. Thank you for joining us. Amanda, we're, we're all lucky to have her on this webinar today. She's an incredible wealth of information and has lots of insights that she'll share. Uh, with you on how to raise money for your organization and thanks to all of you for joining great to be here thank you well let's go ahead and get uh started but uh we have one more set of welcomes or introductions to do and that's uh for those of you who have joined us we have a very full house today and we want to begin by hearing from you so first of all you know just if, in the chat box i see many people letting us know where you're from what you're hoping to hear uh, about today or what kinds of things you're excited about, you know, let us know what you'd like to know about building highly successful campaigns. We obviously have an agenda, but any information you let us know, we will certainly look to uh, really, uh, you know, uh, adjust to that and make sure that we're covering that as well. 
and be sure you're sharing your questions and your insights and your comments throughout uh, and interacting uh, uh, with us anytime throughout the whole session. We're also going to do a little bit of an exercise. Let's call it a calisthenic, which is you know letting you uh, tell us what are your biggest uh, fears or let's you know let's say challenges uh, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, building campaigns. I'm going to just go ahead and tee up a poll right now that you'll be seeing in your uh, in your window. And it'll be, uh, give you a chance to uh, let us know what kinds of things are your fears or challenges. And Amanda, maybe you want to speak to this a little bit. I mean, there are things that we're asking about identifying who to ask, engaging board members, uh, donor fatigue, how do we ask in timing. But there's a whole nother section that I want everyone to answer about, which is other. So you can certainly drop anything into the question box. Yeah, absolutely. In my experience uh, as a, a consultant, uh, I faced a lot of these and, and heard a lot of these uh, same things that you have up on the screen from CEOs, fundraisers, board members, uh, and then the whole pandemic last year, you know, really increased those fears and challenges of especially regarding donor fatigue, um, timing, how often do we ask, all of those things are very, very common. Uh, we hope that we can address some of those today. Um, yeah, wow. Yeah, yeah so I, I, it hit almost even, right? Yeah, yeah, it, it, kind of across the board. They're all fears, and maybe there's all some to some degree in everybody's fundraising mind, right? Or as CEO, that, that you have some fear of all of those. Um, just which one's coming out the, the most prevalent, um, maybe, you know, unique to your circumstances that you're seeing in your community or with your board or, or with your things, but. Hopefully we can address some of those. There's really interesting articles too about the myth of, of donor fatigue. We could do a whole nother series on that and whether or not that really exists or not. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. You know, pretty uh, pretty much in the same shoes as everyone out there, uh, you know, so you're not alone uh, as we kind of move forward. And we're, we're going to uh, take that even a little bit further here in uh, starting off, not so much with the workshop, but giving you some real life uh, example, and this is from Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater Salt Lake, uh, Amanda's club uh, clubs, and so I will let you kind of take it from here and walk us through a little bit of a preview uh, of, uh, of what you did, and then we can use that as a talking point. Sure, thanks. For this uh, specific campaign, this uh, launched, it was my first thing as, as CEO coming back from the consulting world into the CEO seat. Um, our board of directors had made the determination that we were not going to hold an in-person gala again this year. Um, just for some context, our, our organizational budget is, is somewhere between four and five million dollars, uh, and our gala usually raises about four hundred thousand um, dollars of part of our, our revenue. And with COVID and the pandemic, that they weren't feel, feeling comfortable for in-person events. So we wanted to at least net, um, a, a, you know kind of recoup some of those costs from not having an in-person gala and really decided in about a six-week period of, of planning to, to launch this what we called the continuing the mission campaign so this is now a year into the pandemic we had some some specific goals of, of what we wanted to accomplish in there and i'll kind of go over that in a minute too but but primarily we wanted to to create a feel that was an online campaign that gave people an opportunity to give, recapture the people who gave early on in, in the pandemic a year ago, engage our board members, get some sponsorship opportunities for our corporate pop, uh, uh, corporate, corporate partners, um, and, and really you know figure out what we wanted to do um, for the online presence versus the gala versus auction. Um, I, through my experience with the Reva and the platform from consulting, I, I really guys, I was impressed with your your platform and, and what you were able to do and accomplish. And, and so I, I launched into that saying, you know what, I kind of want a one place where we can drive everyone to this campaign. So these are some of the goals. Thank you, David. That gross revenue of $160,000, both from donations and sponsorship, we really wanted to engage our board and we knew we needed them to help us reach um, uh, those audiences. Uh, so we set a goal of 100% board participation. And again, we wanted to acquire new, new donors and reactivate our, our COVID response donors. 
and yet still have some fun energy um, involved in that. So we called it again the continuing the mission campaign and, and asked our board members and committee members who would have served on our, our gala committee to be mission captains. And they were going to then recruit mission makers who would be, that's what we called our individual donor. Anyone who, who made a donation um, were able to become a mission maker. Um, they, uh, you know, were able to um, ask their, their friends and families and coworkers. It was kind of a modified peer-to-peer -peer strategy approach, but we didn't utilize the full peer-to-peer -peer capabilities in the short window of planning time that we had. Um, but we wanted to be able to um, uh, get those mission makers to feel like they, mm -hmm. they had some of those benefits of being at an auction or a gala. So we did an opportunity drawing for everybody. We wanted to um, culminate in this kind of an online broadcast um, that lived in on our website um, where we had one auction item, our, our popular auction item that carries over every year from our galas, a trip to Costa Rica, and then did these opportunity drawings for everyone who, who donated what were in the prize drawings for a trip to the Bahamas, um, spa packages, different things like that. Um, and, uh, and then, really integrate the messaging with mission moments, why their, their um, you know, donations were so important at this time uh, and, and just as important as it was at the beginning of the pandemic. And we really wanted to be able to integrate those um, messages across all of our media channels, our direct mail, email, um, social media, everything that the board members were saying and doing and, and then drive them all back into one, one place. Um, and that was our, our kind of landing, uh, you know, place where our page that we created um, will show that. We wanted to, to culminate the, the campaign in a celebration video and um, uh, made it feel like it was a live broadcast that they were tuning in at that moment. Um, I think we've got some screenshots that we'll show a little bit later. You can see how the, the landing page worked, um, where they could donate, they could um, bid on the live auction, and they could watch the broadcast uh, yeah. there as well, all integrated into the same platform. Um, and uh, we ended with kind of this call to action and mission moment. And uh, just as, as way of illustration, I think, David, you've queued up yeah. for us the video. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to show that. And just FYI, you know, a number of questions, but right at the bottom, you'll see we're going to be sharing out the entire celebration video a URL. And uh, someone on my team will also just drop that into the chat box uh, here, or we will make sure that you get that. So that'll be available to you. So I'm just making some small talk while I flip over to another screen here. So Chris and Amanda, this will come up yep. shortly. Yeah, sure. Um, looks like we've got that, but we wanted to keep it short. So the entire presentation online was only about 15 minutes. It had okay. a countdown going to the live, but it was a pretty short uh, presentation. Great, so here we go. Here's about 60 seconds of it. And this just really tells you how you can really bring that live feel uh, through the virtual uh, element. So take a look. Shanti and I congratulate and thank all of our winners and our mission makers. Thank you for being with us tonight. The world is complicated, but helping kids is not. It just takes all of us coming together to help kids. It takes a safe place and coaches and mentors and teachers and sports and gyms and basketballs and dance spaces and arts programs and crayons and markers and homework help and tutors and computers, technology and STEM activities and healthy snacks and games and field trips and fun and caring staff and community partners and donors and boys and girls and kids and teens and you. Thank you for supporting our kids and thank you for supporting Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater Salt Lake and literally doing whatever it takes to help youth succeed. Okay, great. And Amanda, I'm just going to comment. I let it play all the way to the end because I love the way that you can see the sponsor recognition opportunity right within the video. Right. Thank you. Yeah, it was, um, I don't know if it was buffering a little bit for me on there, but I've seen it a, a million times, but, uh, you know, with technology. But yeah, that was one of our, our themes that, that we felt was most important or 
provided the most unique opportunity was that increased sponsorship recognition, recognition and visibility. Um, you know, at a standard event, you know, they might have a sign or a banner or something in the room um, and maybe on the program that's printed, but, but that increased uh, marketing visibility for our sponsors to be included in the broadcast, to be included on the website um, and, and everything else really expanded their reach and visibility. Um, and so we were able to, to um, really capitalize that and, and get some great sponsorship dollars from, from the events. So, uh, yeah. from the campaign. And that's really great. Well, Amanda, I'm just going to let everyone know if you, for some reason, did not have sound, it all depends on your connection, but we will make sure to include that snippet of video as well as a link on the follow up. And it should be on the recording you received. So, um, you know, it's all part of, I guess, technology. So thank you. Uh, we're moving forward to outcomes. Yeah, so um, short planning window, short, it, we ran our campaign for about four weeks um, uh, live online and then culminated at the end of June with that. And our goal was 160,000. You can see this little snippet of the, the social media post that we posted right after um, the broadcast that we had raised 163,000. Um, once, once we posted that and shared it, we kept our, our URL and landing page and donations online um, live uh, and ex able to accept donations. And we, we got an additional almost $2,500 um, after the event so uh, and the campaign so that we were able to, to still capitalize on a few um, uh, you know straggling donors who came in uh, spurred by that activity um, to, to make a donation. We, we reached our goals of 100% board participation and engagement. I'll talk a little bit more about how we did that and how we made that really easy for board members to participate as we talk about the structure of the campaign. And we were able to acquire some new donors from those board uh, contacts as well as reactivate those lapsed donors that we wanted. So we felt like it was a great success. Yeah, absolutely. And and so, you know, folks, this is just one example. It's a terrific success. We're going to be referring back to this as really a backdrop as we go on today. We're going to be showing some other kinds of things that can be done in some different uh, flavors, if you will. Uh, but thank you so much for that. Uh, we're going to actually uh, move to the portion now that, uh, as promised, is this really essentially step-by-step -step guidance to putting the who, what, where, and how into action. Uh, you know, the why is already implied, but that's part of it as well. So I'm going to go ahead and and let Amanda and Chris uh, kind of take us into this uh, into this section. Yeah, thanks, David. Uh, and uh, feel free to jump in, Chris. I know we've got some some ways that you'll show how how we how some of your other clients are doing this. We really just wanted to to take the structure of how we planned in that short short six week period from uh, you know beginning to end uh, to structure the campaign. Uh, it was kind of this hybrid event and campaign, but we just kept called it a campaign. But the steps are really going to be, um, a, you know, applicable to any campaign you're running, whether you're planning your end of year or whether you're planning for, you know, next year's, um, you know, fundraising plan. Really, these steps that, that we take in at the planning process and implementation can be applied across the board, regardless of it, whether it's a golf tournament or an event or an in-person or online or, or whatever. I really think that these, these uh, steps are, are universal. Um, we start with the what, and I think building your campaign and, and addressing those fears um, you know, head on is, is really important with having a clear plan of how you're gonna get there and creating that roadmap. Um, so of course, you know, identifying what your goals are as I shared mine from, from that campaign. I think it's really important to also have a number of, of non dollar related goals that you can use um, to, to kind of track the effectiveness of, of any campaign. It might be um, number of donors or those uh, reactivating your laps donors, your board participation. It might be your social media presence and hits that you're, you're trying to, to track to see if you're garnering the traffic back to your websites. Um, whatever it is that makes sense to you and what's your priorities, but I think it's important to have clearly defined goals that, that you can measure your outcomes from. Um, one of the tools we used on that is um, uh, I didn't have the full Ariva platform, and Chris will show you a little bit of the more sophisticated way, but if you want to go to the next side, slide, David, um, it shows how I create um, using a campaign's gift calculator. There's a number of, of fundraising uh, philosophies of, of percentages for goals, but we took that $160 
um, amount and broke that out into you know this calculator to go how many gifts do we need at, at different ranges um, and you can see that's how we built that in with sponsorships and individual donors but you could certainly separate that out um, and and these were our giving levels Great. and so yeah go ahead Chris no, David, it sounded like you were going to say something. Well, I was just going to say, I really, I, I so the, the the two slides we were talking about on the left is Amanda's example, and then just to the right is whatever platform you might be using. You know, adding additional technology to that. So again, no one way, but um, it's it, the concept is is really illustrated well on the example on the left. Yep. And and Amanda, what I know that you that there are some sort of conventional wisdom around how many prospects you need, right, yeah. to, to get a certain number of donations, right? Yep, yep, and, and thanks for reminding me. Yeah, and I, I get that, but you know that we want three prospects for every one gift required. It's kind of that three to one. Some people would say two to one. I feel better knowing I have three prospects. So if I need at that $15,000 level, one gift to reach my goal, I know I need three prospects who okay. I think reach that level uh, of gifts um, to make sure that I get that that ask in to those three people and uh, add, uh, out of that three to one hopefully one comes through great Chris we're gonna we're gonna just take a little bit of a turnover to you here and talk a little okay. bit about the general concept of you know building this in your platform your donor relationship management platform if you will uh, what are the essentials yeah yeah no thanks David and thanks Amanda yeah we we do have a product called Exceed Further, a donor relationship management and online fundraising platform that does have some specific functionality around managing your your campaign. And, and just as as Amanda has described, you don't absolutely have to have. I mean, as Amanda said too, she did not have a, necessarily Exceed Further to to manage this campaign. She was using a combination of spreadsheets and an existing database. Uh, so you, you could you, you could use a combination of tools to, to, to track and, and manage and develop your campaign. Uh, although we do have in our system specific features that really align exactly with what Amanda is, is really preaching to you right now, right? Which is ultimately so you create a campaign in our system, you define what your goal is, uh, you set up a, a gift range chart, which the gift range chart is really going to help you. It, it, it's going to help you figure out how many prospects you need to identify to fill in those uh, those gift amounts that you're really going for and ultimately get to your goal. Uh, it's not always going to align perfectly with, with what you forecasted, but but uh, having that gift range chart and, and understanding how many prospects you need to, to to be reaching out to for each for each segment there on the gift range chart is is, is huge. Uh, and you showed Amanda has that, that Excel spreadsheet uh, that she showed, but we also actually have gift range charts that are predefined in our system with some logic behind it that will, all you have to do is put in the, the total campaign goal and it will back out based off your gift ranges exactly how many prospects you, you will need. Uh, and, and, and I'll show you that in a little bit. <laughs> Setting goals for solicitors, obviously you, you typically want to have different types of outreach depending on uh, what you think uh, prospects potential for giving is sometimes you want personal outreach through solicitors or committee members board members volunteers sometimes you you're going to do uh, more general outreach through email or direct mail depending on on how you've identified those prospects so 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 identifying who's going to help you do that personal outreach within your organization or, or outside of your organization and and making sure that they are you're keeping track of of who they are and, and who they're going to solicit and what their goals are so that you can keep that motivation for them to keep reaching out and, and trying to raise that money personally because the, the, the that personal outreach you know I, ideally you want 80 percent of that money coming in for that campaign coming from about really 20 percent of, of your donors those major donors uh, so that so that personal outreach and, and identifying who your solicitors are going to be and tracking their goals and how they're doing and their activity is, is essential. And, and again, we do have those features available in our system. Managing prospects through the through through the cultivation stages, through that we have an ability to to set what your cultivation stages are within our system. Sometimes they are very specific to your process. We have some generic stages, uh, but I mean the, the general stages are, and I think Amanda, Amanda you. you You've mentioned this earlier is that you know identification of who those prospects are that you want to reach out to for this particular campaign and 
and that's huge. I mean, I don't want to, that's one little line here, but I, it, that is in terms of based around some of the questions we've been getting from you and you saw that, that the slides earlier about what a lot of people on this webinar are asking about, you know, donor fatigue and um, you know, how many times should we be asking from them uh, in a year, et cetera. Identifying those those prospects and trying to making sure that you know you're not preventing donor fatigue is is is, is huge. So really, that's going to you're going to be relying a lot on on whatever data you have, right? As also as well as appending external data to potential those prospects to so better understand how to identify those prospects. And we'll talk about that. Uh, and then there's the cultivation stage, which is actually going, figuring out how you're going to reach out to those prospects and, and how you're going to ask them for money and, and how much you're going to ask from them. And then that, and as well as the solicitation part of it, which is actually that you're tracking the solicitors who are going and asking that asking for that money. And then once they've given or not given the stewardship phases, how do you how do you follow up with them once they've once they've given or or have not given to your organization? Uh, so then you can track all those stages as well as others. Some people define the cultivation stage in a more detailed way, and then solicitation stages in a more granular way. It's up to you um, on how you want to define those stages. And then the RFM. Analysis, RFM is just an acronym for rec recency, frequency, and, and the monetary uh, size of, of, of your donor data that you have. So how often have they given um, and, and how many gifts have they given to the organization on an on a annual, you know, multi-year basis? And how much were those amounts? You know, what was their largest gift? What was their most recent gift? Uh, have, they, have they given consecutively over the past five years? Have they given, how many years have they given within the past 10 years? So those are all things that you can very easily get out of our system. And if you're tracking your data correctly and hoping you use the right system, you can get those out of yours as well. Uh, but that's gonna be also key to really identifying those prospects and particularly the ask amount for, for those prospects, right? And then understanding and leveraging relationships. So, so in terms of who's going to go out and solicit that money, how do you how do you know who who those people who who should those people be, right? Yeah. How who's connected to whom within within your organization and outside your organization and prospects? Uh, does board mem does board member X Y Z know this this prospect? Uh, and that's where tracking relationships within your system, who knows whom, which we do have a relationship module to do that, linking essentially you know one person to another, uh, linking an individual donor to their company. There might be other people that, that the company might be able to donate to your campaign. Uh, tracking soft credits, right? So this person's giving through their company. You can, in our system, you can essentially soft credit them to their individual uh, records so that you know that, okay, they're giving through their company as well as, as, as individually. Uh, all that information, as well as just the internal information sitting all in your heads, uh, it, it, it is it's really key to, 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 to going through that prospect list and, and figuring out, you know, how, how and, and, and how much you should be asking, right? And, and so, Chris, uh, you know, this is this is great stuff. I just want we've got a, a number of questions and so many of them were already answered. I just want to let everyone know. So a question about what we're looking at here. Would it be fair to sum up that really, you know, of course, this is not exceed further, but these these bullets are really kind of the capabilities you're going to you're going to need to focus on, regardless of how you're doing that. If it's through you know your platform, if it's doing a combination of technology and and real hands-on kinds of things, but these are the key uh, functions and the key kinds of capabilities you're going to want to look at. Would that be fair, Chris? Absolutely. I mean, I, these are, these are all basic basic steps to to to, to, to yeah. fundraising and ultimately to campaign management. And, and this is an end dimension. Yeah, absolutely. And, and hopefully okay. you're all using a system, uh, either using ours, exceed further, or something like ours that allows you to manage that. Yeah. yeah. No, that's that's great. And we're going to actually take you inside using this as kind of a way to kind of walk through this. Keep in mind, wh wherever you're doing it, this is the kind of stuff you'd want to be doing. So, Chris, I'm going to let you kind of take control Thanks. and jump in and out of these slides sure. as you'd like to. And just remind <laughs> everyone, Keep throwing your questions into the question box. We aren't ignoring you. We're going to pop those in as we come through some of this practical, uh, you know, demonstration here. So yeah. appreciate that. Yeah, so you can give me control. I will share my screen. And I, what I wanted to do was really just show you uh, exactly what I just described, but but really show you, you know, pictures with a thousand words, right? So. Uh, what I'll do is I will show you see further in, in the campaign from a very high level the campaign features within our system that, that really allow you to do exactly what we just discussed. 
Absolutely. Okay. So you can either take it, Chris, or I've, I'm just about there giving you control. I have a little lag. Here we go. All right. Uh, yeah, I know. I, there you go. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Can you all see my screen? We can. Excellent. All right. So this is Exceed Further. This is our donor relationship management and online fundraising platform. Right now, we're looking at what we call the DRM, or for some reason, people call the CRM side of the relationship management side of things. Back end, where, where all the all the donations are being entered, you're managing your campaigns. As you can see on the left hand side, we have a lot more than just such you know fundraising uh, in, within our system and tracking your fundraising efforts. We also have membership capabilities, uh, the management of the campaign module, which I'm going to go through right now. You can track events within our system, volunteers, interest schedules, availability. Tracking the life cycle of your grants. Uh, we have interfaces with many other applications out there, third party, whether they're email marketing or uh, accounting. But I'll, what, what I want to do right now is just quickly go through what it's like to set up a campaign within our system because it really walks you through the exact same steps that I just described, right? So if I'm creating a new campaign within Exceed Further, you essentially just give the campaign a name. You have a, a, a discrete start and end date for your campaign, although you don't have to. Some people just have campaigns that go on and on and they're not sure when they're going to end. Sometimes capital, campaign, uh, capital campaigns can go on for a long time. You do have a goal here that you can put in. I've set my goal at $500,000. So you can see I've marked this as an active campaign. Uh, I have uh, I have stages over here on the right-hand side that I, have, uh, that I have set up ahead of time. We have some default default stages in here. Uh, you don't have to use them all. The ones that I've checked here are the ones that I'm actually going to use for this particular campaign. Again, these are completely customizable. I could change the name of my stages, but these stages are really that that part of the, the of the slide that I talked about earlier where you, you're, you're the, some people call moves management really, but how are you going to move this prospect through the stages of your campaign? You know, you have to identify who those prospects are. You have to decide how much you're going to ask from them. You're going to have to decide who's going to what that follow-up, what that solicitation is going to be for that particular prospect, and then once they have or have not given, how are you going to steward, steward them? Again, people have all types of stages depending on how their specific process. That's why we added this flexibility in here. But you see, I've got some some very basic stages that I've created: identification, cultivation, solicitation, leadership. And as I go to the next tab to to create and set up my campaign, you can see here there's uh, the gift range chart, which aligns almost exactly with 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 the spreadsheet that Amanda essentially created on her own uh, and you know our, which shows you how in general this is it's a fairly standard way of, of being able to understand how many prospects you need to you need to identify within each ask range uh, to, to actually hopefully get that money from them and like Amanda said there tend tends to be a three to one ratio uh, you, you, we actually have some logic built in here that I mentioned earlier where if you put in the goal total amount, uh, we, we have some preset giving levels in here, and it will just back out for you automatically with the number of the number of prospects and gifts that you, you're going to need to find within each one of these levels. Uh, you may not now our our logic. I think it's 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 a little bit different than what you described, Amanda. It's not a straight three to one ratio in general. Uh, I think our logic is that it is around a three to one ratio, but as you go up in the giving levels in terms of the ask amounts. Uh, you actually increase the numbers, that ratio, because the idea is that you're going to need to have a higher uh, higher, number, higher pool of prospects as you go up in ask amounts. Um, but it, again, there are there are many different philosophies around that, so I don't want to dictate to you how, how, whatever your level, your range level should be, and then how many prospects you need because of the number of gifts, and you can customize it, but we do have some logic built in here to automatically support you. All right, and you can see I have levels here, and I've got the gift size the gift size uh, amount that we the range that we're going to ask for we have the number of gifts that we need to raise to meet our goal i've actually my my my, my range chart actually is scheduled out to give me a little bit over my goal and then you can see it calculates the number of prospects you're going to need to, to get those number of gifts within each category right the next Great. step on, on creating a, a campaign within our system is identifying who are your solicitors going to be in our system, you can take any person that you enter in our database and mark them as a, as a solicitor. Uh, and and you, in general, you can have general solicitors for for 
prospects and donors in our system outside of any campaign, but then you can also identify what solicitors you want to utilize for this particular campaign, which is why you have these check boxes over here to identify, okay, right now I've got John Arriva, John Doe, and Mark Jackstone as, as solicitors for this particular campaign. I can work with Mark others. You also have the ability within our system. Sometimes solicitors are working in teams, more than one person. You can take multiple solicitors in our system and, and, and create a team out of them. So that way, when they're making asks, they're going out and asking as a team, uh, not just a particular person. And then I think probably the most critical part of, of, of creating your campaign is this last step, which is, is identifying who those prospects are going to be. Uh, and and then putting them into that camp. What what we in our logic are when you define this campaign, you're essentially adding people within your database as potential donors, that is prospects that you're going to reach out to for that particular campaign. When you're creating a campaign in our system, it starts with the assumption that you've got nobody attached to that campaign as a prospect until you define who those are. So, for example, our system is uh, we're using a powerful DRM solution like this. It's very easy for me to come into our system, uh, segment out groups. I can create lists of people based on, on certain data points, like what was their last gift? How much was that last gift? What's their total giving ever? You know, how many gifts have they given over the last five years, et cetera? And I can segment those lists and I can start identifying them. And then I can add them as prospects to the system. So for example, I created a list and saved it already. And it was my 1000K plus uh, lifetime donors. So I just created that list. All I have to do is select it from my dropdown, click go. I see all the donors here on the left now. And then I have the ability to mark all of them and move them over into our campaign as prospects. And when I do that, a really cool tool here that will save you lots of time versus just manually going into the spreadsheet is that when I move them into that in, into our campaign as prospects, it allows me to add attributes to all those people that I'm moving. So for this particular group who has, I know, given us at least $1,000 or more, I can say, all right, the ask amount for these people tentatively is going to be a thousand bucks. I'm going to say their ask range is going to be within that range. Uh, you can assign a staff member, an internal staff member to those prospects within our system. So I'm going to that, you know, you, you don't have to do that, but you can. I could just say, all right, Ryan's going to be the staff member who's in charge of, of monitoring those prospects. And then you can assign solicitors to go out and ask, whether it's a team or an individual solicitor. I could say, all right, Mark is going to go, is going to be assigned to these, these $1,000 donors. And then you can select a stage to assign to all these prospects automatically. I'm going to put them in the, uh, in the cultivation stage. Actually, I'm going to put them in the ID stage. I'm not quite sure I want all of them to be asked for a thousand bucks. I think there's some potential to get asked more money. Mm -hmm. so do that. And as soon as I save it, they're now going to get put into our campaign module at, under that campaign, and they're going to have campaign entries associated with their record that's showing that they, that for now, tentatively, their, their ask amount should be a thousand bucks for this. For this. They've got a solicitor assigned. And now I can start going through them in a bit more detail to, to see if there's more more information we can flush out for each one of these people to see if, if maybe we should refine that ask a little bit more and as well as who we should follow up with them. And maybe some of them we shouldn't follow up personally. Maybe we should send out an email or or, or a direct mail piece. So yeah. all right. So that I mean it's 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 not that much work to actually set it up in our system. It's it's really about um defining what those that range charts going to be ahead of time and then figuring out who you're going to ID, who those prospects are that you're going to id and, and how you're going to follow up with those so uh, but again this tool makes that a lot easier yeah good, good. chris this is great and we've covered a number of uh, things i want to kind of catch up on just sort of some of the key points here we can jump back in just a moment uh on this as well so let me just make sure that i am sharing my screen uh yes okay so you we, we're back to kind of where we left here and then we'll move forward through these but you know you talked about the steps uh with the campaign builder so i'm going to move forward to the next uh slide which was prospect identification i'll let you kind of walk through these uh as they related to what you just showed yeah absolutely um in terms of prospect identification really there, there's 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 three essential components that I like to think about in terms of identifying who those prospects are. And so that's really a key component to your, to your campaign, right? Uh, one is 
identifying their, their, their re recency, frequency, and monetary analysis, which I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. that hopefully you have a database uh, that has all that information in it. And, and really identifying what they're capable of giving is going to having that, that donation history somewhere in a database, hopefully, and it's accurate data, is going to help you identify what their capacity is for giving in, in the future, right? So how, how much are they given in the past, how often, um, and, and is really going to be key. And if you aren't keeping that data in a database, it's going to be much more difficult to tease out that information and really know how what that ask should be for each one of your prospects. And one of the biggest struggles I see amongst our client base really is about uh, keeping quality data in their in whatever system they're using, right? And, and creating a procedures manual is really going to be key. I, I've always I've been to get on my high horse on from the support side of, of supporting so many organizations out there. It's create an internal procedures manual so that data goes in is quality. Because if you don't have quality data going in, what you're going to get out is going to be garbage. So anyway, I that re, the, the I, I, looking at their past donation history is going to be very helpful in term, terms of identifying what, that, what they're asking for your particular campaign. You can also look at external data uh, when, you're, when you're identifying who your prospects are and their capacity for giving. Well, we, have, we have partnerships with, with several different uh, prospect research firms, Wealth Engine and Donor Search. It's huge. They will, uh, they will take your a subset of your records or all your records. You have an easy way to just send them all of the records in your system. They will append. Uh, wealth data to 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 those records, and then you can bring them back into our system, which is that's really the key. Uh, it, is that you can combine external prospect research information with the data that you have on your donors to really tease out like, okay, wow, this person's been giving us you know 50 bucks a year for the past 10 years, but oh my gosh, I mean, you know they they have a capacity to give us you know, $10,000, and you just didn't know that, but that prospect research data could help you identify some of the people that are potentially able to give you a lot more money. Um, and typically, the, those prospect research firms are, are giving you back data based on uh, what their capacity to give is uh, and, and what their affinity is to potentially your cause, which is they, they're, they're getting crazy information out from uh, all over the internet and in scary ways, honestly, to be able to figure out how, how aligned they are potentially with your cause and how likely they may be able to give to, to, to your organization and how much. So that really leveraging that prospect re research information is huge, right? Uh, and, and I would just jump in too, yeah. like the key to all of this is that segmentation, the ability yeah. to yes. segment these donors. Once you've got your prospects in that gifts range chart and you know kind of where you're going, that wealth screen wealth screening and your information and the information that's in your CRM, whether it's a reader or whatever, is what helps you figure out what level you should put them at, right? Which gift amount. But then those gift amounts, you're going to have different segmentations of how you're speaking to each of those um, prospects. And you might have different approaches, different targeted messages through different media channels. And that's what's going to help you give you your roadmap for for who you're talking to and through which communications, uh, you know, streams and whatnot. That segmentation, I think, is one of the most key points in fundraising principles is being able to personalize and customize the, the message to your different audiences. It really is. And that was, a, you know, one of the third component to assessing their giving level was connectivity, Amanda, right? And, and really sitting down and going through that that prospect list in detail with 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 your staff, with your board, right, with your volunteers, seeing who knows whom, what the, the information that they have on them, uh, and understanding those relationships. It, it, that that also is is huge, right, in, in, in helping decide what that that asset should be. And, and to your point, Amanda, I mean, I just a quick side story. Uh, I know of an organization I, who uh, was. I know a person personally who was a, a major donor for an organization. They were giving ten thousand dollars a year for, for over a decade, and they got a new uh, development director. And she, this donor, who was a major donor to this organization, received a, a very generic letter in the mail uh, that just she could tell what happened. Basically, they just they spit out their donor list of everyone who gave last year. They figured out what that amount was, and then they just increased it by twenty percent, and then just Use the form letter to put that amount in there. So she got a letter saying, "You know, dear Jane, would you like to increase your your donation to you know ten thousand two hundred dollars this year?" Well, 
she number one, they they probably left some money on the table so they could have got more if they actually did a personal outreach. Number two, they alienated the donor because they didn't do a personal yeah. outreach. They didn't really assess what those amounts were, who they were within that list, and then figure out what type of outreach they should they should have depending on that. So don't do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. speaking as somebody new into the CEO role, you know, granted I had nine years of history at our organization before taking it, but even still those relationships and knowing your donors and that historical information and making really smart decisions, especially at the top range of your gift chart, right? You can, you know, get a little more generic and a little less personal at some of the lower ranges or your broad appeals to new donors. But when you're talking about a $10,000 ask or higher, you really want to, you know, create a custom strategy and know, you, know your donor um, really well in their history. And that information should live within your CRM uh, to help yeah. people like me who are brand new in the CEO chair. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna just jump in a little bit with some moderating here to keep us moving. We're, we're gonna go over a, a little bit here. Everyone will get the full recording, but I'm just letting you know we're we're kind of moving to uh, to the who, the activity and prospect tracking. You want to kind of talk a little bit through that uh, and just share that with our with our audience. That'd be great. I mean, I think that's really what we've been talking about. We kind of said, wait yeah. a little bit, right? Uh, uh, from yeah. into the what and, and that prospect identification uh, is really all part of the, that qualifying your donors um, and, and aligning with, with you know, what you've got in your CRM. Uh, I wish I'd had the exceed further tool because I did from my campaign's gift calculator into a prospect tracking sheet um, where I had, I took, you know, those three to ones. Once I qualified all my donors, um and, and figured out which gift range they were in then i created that custom you know strategy for them for, for you know are they going to get a phone call first are they going to get invited for coffee by our board member or, and then manage that task and i had to go create it on spreadsheet first and then kind of go put it into the back end of my crm um, but that's exactly what we did is created that segmentation um for for uh, our appeals and approaches and and which media channel and with whom um, of our board members, that was one of the ways we were able to really engage our board members um, uh, more specifically, is giving them the, those clear tasks and assignments, um, and, and making sure that they knew what what their their job was, and then tracking that information there. You know, Amanda, one of the questions that's come up, and, and to Chris as well, is just you know what what should and should not be expected from boards in fundraising efforts. As we kind of move forward to the next piece, that would be great to kind of interject here. From your sure. Sure, when I, I talk a little bit more about board engagement and I can expand further on that, but of course, we our goal of 100% board participation, then you have to define what is what, what qualifies as participation, right? Uh, we expect all of our board members to make a personal meaningful contribution at whatever gift level is comfortable to them, um, to our campaign efforts as well, as well as helping to um, make connections to potential donors or current donors, um, Thank every 100% participation in thanking our donors, um, but we also um, would, would hope that they would help us ask. Yeah. Um, if they're not even comfortable making the ask, getting the meeting or getting in front of them or opening the uh, door or making an introduction. Um, sometimes the, your board member is not the best person to ask, even though <laughs> regardless of no matter how much training you give yeah. them. Um, but their connections and their circle of influence is is so important to being able to reach reach your message. And and if they care about your organization and are passionate about your mission, it's likely that their friends are going to be as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so they want to, you know, I think taking away some of the fear of going, I'll do the ask, I'll make it. All you have to do is share your important message of why this this cause and 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 why this mission is important to you and why you get involved and, and make that introduction and I'll make the ask, right? And it's yeah. really about matchmaking and 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 getting a chance to get in front of people with the message. But yeah, you're I mean, there, your biggest ambassador, 100% should be your biggest true. ambassador. Yeah. And, and just to add on to what you're saying, Amanda, I mean, which is all true. I mean, sometimes there are, there are board members who are just very hesitant to make asks, right? Or, or you don't want them to. Uh, but but there are other ways to to more passively have them be engaged in fundraising, right? Through let's say in, through giving vehicles like a peer to peer fundraising program, right? Which we have a platform to easily create peer to peer campaigns so that board members can create their own fundraising pages and, and ask for money virtually instead of having to do it first, right? So there are other ways to yeah. 
Yeah. Well, we'll be, we'll be talking a bit about those. I'm going to kind of close this out here on the who and the what uh, on the prospecting. I know you showed a bit of the demo inside. If there's anything, Chris, you want to point to here, uh, and you know, uh, I, I, yeah, I don't I don't know how we're doing on time, David. I mean, ultimately, you know, what I was going to do was share my screen and just kind of show you what a donor profile looks like. If we have time, if not, don't worry about it. But really, it was it was it was about. Uh, how do you identify, you know, how do you tell when this is a good prospect? It really goes back to the, the who part of, of identifying your prospects, right? Which, which Amanda was reinforcing, you know, and yeah. how do, when you were looking at a, a donor record, how do you know this is a, how do you know this is someone that's a potential good prospect and, and um, what data should I be tracking for my donors, my prospects and my system so that I can assess that uh, really in, in, in our system, was designed around that idea, right? Which is uh, tracking as much information as you can that's gonna be relative to, to, to making future asks. And you can see here, I'm just on a standard donor profile. And at the very top, you can see there's an identifier here that says major donor. I mean, this, this actually is an automatic identifier that happens in our system based off parameters that, that our users define. So you can have in our system, uh, a, a very obvious identifier based on their prior giving history of, of whether or not they're a major donor or a potential major donor or uh, you know uh, maybe they're a lower end donor or whatever that is you, you can create some logic in our system that automatically gets updated based on their donation history here there are other systems out there that do have things like that too you know like saying how engaged is this is, is this person with your organization? Although you want to be careful about those sort of algorithms and how they calculate. I mean, it, it's really, you, you can't get around really digging down and understanding um, from a high level what, how this person is affiliated with your organization because it could be in many different ways, right? And here we try to yeah. give you that 360 degree view of what are all the activities that we have with, with this, you know, how, how many, how many appeals have we sent out via, via snail mail and email or, or even personal? Or what does their, their donation profile look like? What's their giving summary? What are their relationships that they have between them and, and other people within your organization or database? Um, what are the, where their prospect research? You know, again, this is all integrated with yeah. our system. What really, what is their potential for giving that, that, that may be much higher than what they're giving to your organization? And what is their likelihood to give, right? Which is something that donors are told us for, for you. Uh, what, are the, what, are the, what are the what are the cat past? What are the what are their what are the campaign asks you've made in the past, right? So you can see here we've had three campaigns right now uh, listed. There's actually 21 total just for this donor. So you can go back and look at prior asks if you're tracking this in a, in a system like ours, right? And, and see what they actually gave versus what they're asked, what their event attendance was, are they volunteering with the organization currently or in the past, etc. So really, the point of showing you that was just that if you're using a an all-in-one system like ours that you, you, you can get that view, that, that pulse, holistic view of your prospects yeah. you know, as you're going through and trying to identify that, that task. Well, and Chris, you're really not flying blind either. So you mentioned earlier donor fatigue and just making sure you're not over asking. I mean, you're, you, you have a really good sense of how often you're having touch points with, with the folks here. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm gonna, I wanted to give you a chance to show that, and, you, you know, there were a couple of things in terms of just if you wanted to point to using lists and tags, I know you've talked about that, but otherwise I'm going to go back uh, kind of into the flow and start to talk about some giving vehicles. So if you want to take a, a, a couple of minutes here just to point out anything I'll, else. I'll take just a, a one minute, really. I, yep. we, we have something in our system called list. Not all systems have, a, have the ability to let you view your data in, in sort of a spreadsheet format like this and, and, and interact with it. But uh, I think it's one of the really powerful parts of our system where you can bring up essentially lists of records in our system. It could be a list of donations, a list of people, a list of grants, whatever you want really. And you can, you can filter those lists based on whatever data points you want. And, and then you can interact with those lists. You can, you can recall tag them, you know, seg mark, mark them with a, with an identifier to, to, that's maybe a segment group that you're working with, people who gave last year over 500 bucks, people, uh, lapsed owners who haven't given since, uh, you know, X, Y, Z. Uh, and then you can, and you, can, you can also attach activities to people on the list. You can export the list to a spreadsheet because you want, you know, your, let's say your board member or committee members to review all of the people on this list. Uh, you can send out an email to these people, you can print it. So there, there's lots of things you can do with our list, but the, really the, the power of the list is that I can come into a, 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 our filters 
and I can segment these lists however I want. You know, I want to get everybody who whose total giving ever is you know five thousand or more, and uh, their most recent uh, gift was you know their 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 last gift date was uh, let's say last year, right? So I could I can do that very easy in our system because the lists are, are set up with, with filters to do it. Uh, and and it's 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 a really powerful thing to use if you enter the right dates. Yeah. And it's really just a matter of of defining your parameters and clicking go. You get the list. I can interact with these people. I can I can drill down on them to get more information on them like that. I can like again I can I can tag them. I can add them to a campaign. So the, the power of lists are, are, are huge for us. We, of course, have standard, we have hundreds of standard canned reports that you could also run, you know, live up report they gave last year, not this year. I can get solicitor reports that are going to help me show what the activity is relative to my solicitors and their outreaches and, and, and how are they doing versus their goal. Um, so, so using a, a donor relationship management system like this really does, it's a powerful tool. And if you if you if you if you if you take Amanda's knowledge that she's imparting to you right now and apply it to the, to the tool, it's it's a game changer. Yeah, absolutely. I was just gonna say I think that the difference between going from a um, good campaign to a you know greater campaign uh, is is really using data to inform your decisions, right? Using um, data driven decision making is I think the, the best way you can make sure you're kind of on target with where you want to be. Um, and what we really have, have kind of, the data is where you can get really cerebral. And, and um, I love, you know, like Chris is talking about all these really powerful tools that we have as fundraisers that sometimes we don't even realize that, that we can utilize to, to help um, go from a scattershot approach, right? Of like, I'm just going to throw a bunch of um, uh, direct mail pieces out there put some social media pages up and hope I got a landing page, right? And hope people come to it to really a laser target um, approach. Of we're gonna laser in on this um, specific person that we know very much um, information about all this qualification and prospect stuff that we've taken. And we have a specific ask for a specific, specific purpose, purpose, I can't speak today, uh, and through these specific channels of, of that's customized to them. And obviously you can't do that with all 3,000 donors in your donor base, but you should be doing that with 30 top prospects or 25 or 50 um, to really go from the scatter shot to the laser target. And that's what the data helps you get to, um, which is a great segue into, into giving vehicles. So thank you. Because this is really, you know, so we just talked about those steps, right? Of what your campaign is, what your goals are, who are your prospects? Now, where does that campaign live and, and where are you talking to all of those different audiences and segmented, segmented um, groups? Um, and you have a bunch of tools at your disposal, right? From, from our very generic uh, appeal letters to emails and websites to your, of course, landing pages, um, some of the more sophisticated to the peer-to-peer the -peer text to fund and social media. Um, this is what um, the screenshot you're seeing here. This is what our landing page looked like. So all of those um, uh, appeals, regardless of platform, whether it was on Facebook or an email or a, an email that a board member sent, drove everyone back here where they could make a, don a donation, they could watch, they could bid, they could get into that, the drawing, whatever they wanted to do. Um, and that was really important that, that we had kind of this universal landing page for, for all encompassing of our campaign. And, you know, and I think it's really a common theme you're going to see here is make it easy uh, for people to give in many different ways. Make sure to communicate your message. And, and one of those, we just have an example here that we're showing. And, and Chris, you certainly could, could speak to these uh, a, a little bit just on some recent examples of some, some wild websites that kind of hit all the key things your, your donor-centric site should be doing. If you want to go one more slide. I think this shows a few more examples of what I was just talking about mm -hmm. um, of, of how we branded everything so it all had the same similar look and feel similar content but our content but we were able to tweak the messages um, and the order which in people receive different messages right so if we wanted to make sure we hit a phone call first and then the email or if we wanted the letter to hit and then then our board member was going to call up and say hey Joe do you did you get that letter did you see my email what each of those action steps were, but it was all branded to look the same and then drive kind of the same place. 
Yeah, and I may have lost lost place here, so I could be fired as moderator, Amanda. So I appreciate that, but we'll be hitting it here. And so we're just we, we you know, we're kind of showing you the website, the messaging here. I'll just kind of hit this. You know, it's it's make it very clear that there's a place to donate now. That you're telling your story with impact. You're giving people ways to give, but also to kind of tee to the next place. Uh, ways that they can get involved, whether it's a board member, a donor, a volunteer, or what have you. So these are just two sites, one for the Pontifical Mission Societies of Boston, another for the Social Cog, great organization dealing with adults with autism uh, and spectrum disorders and, and other uh, associated uh, types of issues. Uh, and then you know, talking about donation pages, I'll kind of tee that up to the two of you to just speak in general to some things that are best practices when you're uh, looking at putting lots of different versions of donation pages or landing pages, if you will, out there. Yep. We would talk about, you know, uh, I think one, making sure that it's easy and accessible and that it's very, has a clear call to action and a story um, and that illustrates what you want to do. Um, I talk a lot um, about best practices on landing pages about above the scroll. You want your call to action and, and your most visual thing above the scroll, wherever you would have to, you have to scroll down. Um, or if you're on a web, uh, you know, a mobile viewer, do you have to swipe left or right to see it? So you kind of want to make sure everything's kind of optimized uh, for web uh, and mobile versions. But also, you know, where where does your eye go? What, what's the call to action? What do you want them to do? And is if they have to scroll down to see that, um, then you're probably going to miss it out. Your yeah. people hit on a landing page, and you have about 30 seconds to capture their attention, and then they're going to go somewhere else. Well, and speaking of which, I guess one of the things I'd point to as well is just you want to optimize that opportunity. You have someone in a giving moment, if you will. You want to make sure you've been able to maximize that yield by, you know, uh, allowing them to give a recurring gift to, you know, integrate matching gifts to yep. allow them to cover the processing fees. So some, you know, some of those things are highlighted in the example at the right, but those are just and best practices. You're already in campaign mode. You might as well make sure you are getting the highest rates you possibly can. Yep. Absolutely. Sorry, just share, you know, easy for them to share the message and share it with their friends, social, you know, the social media aspects and different things like that. And and hopefully you're using a platform that allows you to have as many landing pages as you want, like ours, right? And you can really tailor those landing pages to the ask, right? Uh and and maybe be more specific in that ask. I mean, on that prior slide you saw, David, you can see that a lot of our clients have been doing this lately where they're they're really tying you know, the, the donation to a specific program so that the donor, you know, really feels like they are giving, uh, they're really supporting a specific, specific specific initiative within your organization, potentially. So really tying that yeah. donation to, to something, you know, solid, yeah. Yeah, I mean, in this example, you have six different ways at least to give, right? And it's all coming into the same uh, platform. Uh, and then here's just an example of, you know, whatever platform you happen to be using, make sure it's giving you the ability to have integrate the, uh, would you like to make this a recurring gift? Would you like to cover the processing? It's not commonplace, but it's something very, uh, very, you know, unique to ours. Uh, so let's talk about peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. It's come up a couple of times. Uh, you know, here's just some examples. Uh, Chris, could you take us uh, down this journey a little bit? Sure, yeah, absolutely. We have a peer-to-peer -peer platform that, that I, Again, I mean, that's the, the, the basics of peer-to-peer of -peer fundraising are all, are all pretty much the same, right? It allows people that are affiliated with the organization some way or another to create basically personal fundraisers, to raise money for your organization, right? It's very intuitive and easy to use. Really, they can, you can all, you can point, again, as I mentioned earlier, like if, you're, if you have a board member who is a little hesitant to, or, or you're hesitant to let them go out and speak directly with talk with prospects, you can, you can have them easily log into a, a our peer-to-peer -peer system and create their own fundraiser and uh, and start sending it out, post it on social media, whatever, and, and and draw their the people within their circle to your organization and allow them to easily um, give money to your organization and and really kind of also at the same yeah. time support their friend or who, however they're affiliated with that person, right, to, to raise money for your organization. So you know we've seen this used in in, in many different ways, whether it's for supporting a campaign or I maybe mean, it's it's, it's it's supporting you know adding on a, a new building to 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 their office or whether it's to support a specific cause or program within their organization. Uh, it, it's you can tailor it however you want and it's completely customizable. But but it is a it is it is really it's a very easy way to 
to have that multiplier effect, right? Yeah. Having a few people create those 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 fundraising campaigns for you, uh, so you're not doing work, and they're out there raising money for you. And again, it's virtual, so it's it's it, it may be a little less intimidating to some people than going out and making the ask in person, right? Yeah, and people have their phones with them everywhere. I mean, if they didn't before, they certainly do these days, you know, as we say, right? Um, but one of the things that's great, I love to point out here, Chris, is on this example, making it easy for someone to answer the to have the answer to the question, how can we help? So that you are allowing them to know that they can create a, you know, a personal fundraiser. It's easy, you know, it's very simple. One, two, three, they set it up. Uh, and, you know, walking the walk. So in this case, the leadership at the organization, you know, created a fundraiser, but there are multiple ones you can't see here. And then, you know, that just really multiplies the multiplier effect, if you will. And, and the last thing I would just say is that all of the things that we're talking about are not an either or. They're oftentimes and, and ideally used in tandem. Another one of those things is, is this whole notion of text-based donations or text to fund as as we, we've listed here, could you speak to that and how that fits into some of the things we talked about? Right, uh, text-based fundraising is is something you're hearing more and more about just because uh, this, uh, uh, following up to people via text tends to be more effective. The hit rates are higher, you're gonna have more likely have a response, uh, reaching out to someone via text than you would via email, right? Email click rates are going yeah. down, and, SMS is still uh, doing very well. So we do have now text-based text, text -based communication within our DRM side of, of our platform, as well as on the, on the fundraising side of things externally. We have a platform called text to fund which allows you to easily ramp up a text-based campaign. Uh, you can very easily uh, basically set it up. You, you just, you, all you have to do is, is upload everybody that has a essentially has a, a, a mobile phone number, right? And you can send out that cam, you can send out a campaign, but really what you're trying to do is you're trying to draw people in, right? So usually it requires some marketing efforts on your part, you post it on your website, maybe you send out an email blast uh, to, to get people to you know, post it on your campaign landing pages. So instead of necessarily giving by uh, via a um, you know, website or sending a check, they can just easily text mm -hmm. a number It'll, it'll send them back a link. They click on it on, in their, on their phone and boom, they can just give right there. Yeah. So it's, it's very, very few clicks, uh, very easy for them to donate, removing the barriers for, for giving, right? Yeah, and so we're talking about seconds, right, Chris? I mean, this is what's interesting here is this is an example of Ron McDonald House Charities of South Florida. And what's really interesting is they do all the sending things out, doing different elements with unlimited donation pages. But everywhere you turn you see text home to 71760 so that could be someone at an event saying who has their phone with them the answers everyone right who doesn't and at that point you can just tell people enter you know uh, text home to 71760 or if you're on a if you have a public relations opportunity if you're on the news anywhere where you're on social giving tuesday is one of those things you want to be thinking about where you can have a quick sound bite or a quick uh you know, character limited message and you can get it across so someone can take action. So this is definitely really great stuff. Um, it really goes back to what Amanda has been, you know, talking about, right? Those having as many giving vehicles as possible. Yeah. Right, for people. Yeah. So here's some other blended live and virtual auctions, events and galas. And we work with, you know, we work with lots of different types of events and there's, there is no one size hybrids kind of the fashionable word out there. We like to refer to it as blended, which is really an ideal mix. Think of a, of a of a dashboard. You're just kind of turning the knobs to the right mix for you. But uh, you know they they go together. It just makes sense. It's really after these times. That's kind of what we're looking at. To the left, we have Amanda's example. But to the right, we've seen everything from Night at the Oscars, uh, integrating you know virtual auctioneers, uh, you know using green screens to bring everyone into a real life kind of experience and being able to measure that. And uh, we have some expertise and services around that that we'll share a little bit on. But, uh, you know, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to this notion as a vehicle, Amanda? Yeah, actually, I, I, just from my perspective, this is just my opinion only. Um, I don't think virtual uh, and or in-person events will ever be exclusive again. Yeah. Um, I, I think as we adapt into a new normal, that, that or whatever that phrase means, right, I think that the things that are positive about a virtual experience, like that increased sponsorship visibility, 
the increasing your your audience um, base uh, and your ability to reach more people um, will blend into in-person events at, at some point and I think probably should right that yeah. there are good things there are good things and bad things about in-person and and uh, and virtual um, and I think as we I, I don't think we're gonna see it a full on restrictions and you know yeah. lift anytime soon but as we come out into wherever I think we'll take the best of both and continue yeah. to blend them together. I, I would agree, Amanda, and I would just tell you from some of these examples, I, I, I believe it was the uh, the Geneva Lakes Family YMCA, they extended their reach and their impact. So they had people that were that hadn't been in touch for some time that were donors and you know the new donors and the people who can be involved. And you know, you're gonna just extend the audience. You're not limited to the to the size limit of your venue, whatever that might be. So so good stuff. Yeah, and we just had a an example. We had a client that is part of an affiliate of a larger organization, and um, they had an entire interim auction set up and ready to go uh, in, in a few months. And the the global office handed down saying, "No, I'm sorry, you know, COVID's raging. Uh, we're we're going to put the hammer down to, and and they're not allowing any interim events for the rest of the year. So they had to pivot quickly yeah. uh, to." To virtual and luckily they're using our system and they could do that. But yeah, it, it's it, there's so much uncertainty out there right now. Like Amanda said, I think I, you know hybrid is sort of here to stay. So here we are. We've been seeing lots of questions. Board th those pesky board members. You know we love them, right? This is <laughs> this is what's been coming up. But let's 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 take this head on. Uh, Amanda, you want to lead us through this? Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, as I said, your board members are your biggest ambassador. They're also, you know, your biggest um, connector to other in circles of influence outside of your own of, of those um, uh, new, you know, the donors who who love you and, and care about you already for the past 50 years. Your your board members are, are your next circle out to reaching new audiences as well. Um, and I think that, that through my experiences, um, Board members are hesitant to ask, or you hear a CEO or a fundraiser go, my board members, they're they're not a fundraising board, or they're too scared to ask, or they don't know what, or my board members aren't engaged, um, which is usually a symbol to me, or a signal to me that the board members disengage when they feel like they don't have a clear assignment and they don't know what their task is. They don't feel like they have the tools enabled to, of what they need to do, or they, they don't have the education to back that up. And, and education, I mean, the, like the training, the learning, the, our jobs as, as staff and, and fundraisers to help train them so they feel comfortable. So if you can remove those barriers of clear expectations, uh, the tools they need to do that, and, and the education and training that they need, the information to share, the words to say, that, then you're gonna increase the, their board engagement um, and participation. And we just wanna make it easier for them to do that. Um, I don't know if you've got the, the slide up. I'm getting a little bit of a lag from slide transitions time, so I can't tell what exactly. Yeah, what it's up, doing. but it should be coming across the web soon. Yeah, we've got what we created um, for our campaign for continuing the mission was a toolkit. I wanted to make it really easy for board members to get involved. Um, and so we created a, a, a toolkit that we gave them uh, both in person, here's your handed out um, printed copy, as well as electronic. Um, that had everything that they need to to um, to become a mission captain and recruit their mission makers, which is a very peer-to-peer -peer style fundraising yeah. strategy, right? Um, it, it gave them the sample, um, it had clear actions of what we asked them to do as a, as a board member, what their goals were, how many people we wanted them to ask, who they were assigned to. We gave yeah. them all the prospect list of connectivity from our CRM that people have come to their galas before and sat at their tables, all that kind of stuff. But we gave them also then, you know, the the sample letter messages, talking points, the social media posts. We actually drafted several posts uh, posts that they could copy and paste and edit yeah. and customize the email templates that they would want, uh, the QR codes, the hashtags that they needed and made it really, really easy for them to, to get involved to share the message. Um, most were willing to share and wanted to, they just needed to, when yeah. they're busy, they're volunteers, um, maybe they're not comfortable on social media, maybe they're not comfortable. So it's like, here, just copy and paste this into your Outlook email, or copy yeah. and paste this, uh, or send this letter to your friend, or hand this to them, you know, when you see them for coffee or in line at the store. 
um, it made it very easy for them to be able to share the message and the calls to action of what we wanted them to do. Well, the, you know, what's great about this too, Amanda, is that, uh, you know, it, the board members have good intent. They always want to help. They're, they're with your organization for a reason. And, right. but nobody wants to not know exactly what to say. And, uh, you know, they're busy and you want to make sure that the messaging is out there. They want to make sure everything's looking professional. Something like this really goes a long way in that regard. So I did, I, you know, kudos to you on this. This is a terrific example of just, you know, one, one way that uh, you could really, uh, you know, activate your, your board. Yeah, it, it really is. Yeah. I mean, Andy did a great job on this. I mean, it, it is it's very prescriptive and detailed. And I think Amanda, you're generous enough to share it with people that are attending this webinar. It's, it's an incredible resource. So, so thanks, Amanda, for yeah, for your absolutely. And and you know, I've I've seen other boys and girls clubs using similar styles. And and really, kudos to my my team who who helped pull this off, and some of the board members who who took it and ran with it. And we're using utilizing that same concept now. So we're doing that toolkit for them for every campaign or event that we're doing. We're we're hosting a golf tournament in two weeks, and we've created a, a golf you know uh, committee toolkit. Yeah. We'll have an end of year campaign, and we'll create the toolkit. We've got that. We know what they need um, is they need the words, they need yeah. the links, they need all of those things. They they need the samples, and and they're more than happy to participate and share if we make it really easy for them to do so. Absolutely, that's clear. Uh, you know, we are we are very closer to question. In fact, we're at question point. I'm going to walk through a little bit. Of, if you have questions that you would like to ask, there are some teed up. I'm going to quickly walk us through uh, a little bit of information because we've had a lot of questions around the software and services. But just head this off by telling you we're actually offering anyone who's on today or anyone that you'd like to pass this along to a free consultation and demo. Could be 10 minutes about anything we've covered or anything uh, that we haven't covered today. But, you know, first off, we've talked about exceed further digital fundraising and donor relationship management solution. It's truly the only all-in-one solution out there feeding into a single unified database. Uh, it is providing all of these kinds of capabilities that you can see here, everything on the digital fundraising side from online donations to peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. Someone asked about event management, being able to have events and table seating and being able to put out a promotion uh, around those types of uh, elements as well as uh, even memberships and volunteers, online pledges. Uh, Chris, of course, talked about campaign management. We do hospitality management. In fact, we work with uh, the lion's share of the Ronald McDonald House charities, uh, healthcare hospitality houses uh, across the world and uh, recurring gifts and all the capabilities intertwined. Uh, lots of great robust reporting, uh, all really kind of detailed here. You'll get the presentation, so I, you know, I won't really note that. I do want to point out something that came up a couple of times, though, and I loved what you said, Amanda, about the above the uh, above the scroll, if you will, today's version of above the fold. It's very important that whatever you use, that everything's mobile, mobile responsive and mobile optimized. Two different concepts, and everything that we do is so that you know the things that need to be front and center are front and center, and everything's there for you to see across all of our solutions. We talked about uh, for Exceed Further Clients, we do new custom websites. You can kind of see the before and the after. Uh, we've we've really been able to uh, work with all kinds of different clients. It's a faith-based organization, really presents the Pope and the organization in a really, really wonderful branded uh, opportunity here. And uh, again, we work with, uh, uh, Amanda talked about Maestrosoft, uh, you know, indirectly, which is an Ariba company. It's really our auction bidding and text-based solutions. Uh, fully integrated with everything we do, and uh, so that enables people to do those live, those virtual, those blended types of events, and to be able to do everything from your phone and from uh, from multi devices. And so that's very, very important. Uh, in addition to that, we're very a big distinguishing factor is that we don't assume that you know how to do everything. So we work uh, and have you know worked with Amanda and others. We we do consulting. We help you identify what you what is it that you want to do and what kinds of things can we include? In some cases, someone will use an MC and an auctioneer. We have a professionally trained expertise in that area, so we'll provide those kinds of things as well as uh, consulting services. Again, mobile optimized, and again, we do all of those things together. It doesn't mean you need to do them all, but these are very, very touchable types of solutions, easily justified by the return on investment. So I get the award for my version of auctioneering and running through that and getting us a little bit back on target. Thank you, Amanda <laughs> and Chris, for indulging. Um, I'm going to move it over to uh, to some questions here. And as I do that, I'm just going to pull up a poll. So 
Uh, Chris, you should be able to see the questions in here as well if you want to grab one or two while I uh, lift this up and uh, and then we'll come back to that. Yeah, I mean, I, there's there's quite a few and they're varied. I don't have time to get through them all, so I okay. apologize in advance. Um, yeah, but there was one is, you know, how are events managed within the CRM? We definitely have, you just mentioned, David, an event management piece. Uh, it's, it's really about attracting attendance-based events, you know, whether it's a golf tournament or a banquet, et cetera. It attracts RSVP status. You can set up ticket purchases and sponsorships online. Uh, we also have an entire auction software suite specific for auctions, like you just mentioned, David. Um, someone asked, you know, how do we track, can we track stock gifts in our system? Yes, there's a, there's a method code that allows you to track in-kind donations and stock and the amount you sold it for versus the value, et cetera. Uh, that's not a problem at all. We have someone asking, how do we handle getting permission when you're sending out oh, I can take that one, Chris. Got, oh, yeah. I've got, I've got I just, one, one thing I just wanted to share with you all, and, and I'm going to use this as a little bit of a segue, keep answering the poll, because one of the things you could talk to us about, for example, on this consultation is texting. What's up with that? Right? You could just make it that simple. We could talk to you about it, because there's a number of things that apply. But I'll give you a real quick primer. You want to make sure you're looking at all of the kinds of things related to can spam regulations, et cetera. But generally, if you have the mobile phone number, and you know it's a mobile phone number, and you've received that during the due course of your business, you have the, uh, you have the opportunity to, to communicate to that, to that donor, if you will. You need to make sure that you're just following some standard practice, which is to include the ability for them to text stop and to opt out immediately. Uh, I'm sure many of you have received those kinds of messages. That's generally the best way. Another thing to look at is to implement really a, uh, a campaign from your end, and we can help you with ideas on that so that you could set up a campaign that is really going out as part of your email to let people know that you have these opportunities and how they can share that. And please be sure to share your, uh, your uh, mobile phone number because we can give you updates on whatever it might be. Say that it's something for volunteers or it's related to guests on our hospitality solutions or it's related to some other important notification. Uh, we can set that up to your parameters. So that's just kind of a quick answer on that. Okay, thank you, David. Yeah, and we've had a, quite a few questions actually around the same idea of, of how, do, how does an organization diversify their revenue? I mean, that's a big question. I can't answer it in a minute. I, and Amanda probably has more insight than I do on this. Uh, and you know, I, I do. We do get a lot of clients though who are too dependent. That they're actually coming to us and getting our software because they're too dependent on other sources of revenue, whether it's on the program side or the government side or or, or from foundations and grants. And they and they really are trying. And, and the the best way to diversify for them is, is ultimately to build up an individual donor base, really. And and those are the those organizations have a large individual donor base and, and those individual donations are making up the majority uh, of their revenue are usually the best insulated uh, to swings in, in revenue particularly if you know government funding dries up or you know something like COVID happens all of a sudden your programs are ending because you, COVID hits and you, you can't actually have your programs anymore uh, having that individual donor base is key right and building it up I, I mean Amanda I'm sure you could talk a lot more than, than I could yeah. You know, you're right on the money with that, no pun intended, um, but the individuals, you know, absolutely is your most um, diverse revenue stream because it's made up of multiple people as opposed to one source or, or one or two, right? So you want to look at your full revenue streams uh, and each source, and, and if you were to envision that as a pie chart, for a diverse or, or diversified portfolio, revenue portfolio, you would want to make sure that no one piece of that pie with the exception of individuals is greater than than um, you know 35 percent and if you're looking at that you know pie chart and you've got a, a piece of it that is 50 percent or greater that your organization is extremely vulnerable for long-term sustainability if that piece of the pie goes away whether it's government an event um what whatever it is a, a grant program fees you know program fees could were drastically impacted by for, for my organization from from uh, COVID, we were lucky it was only a one tiny sliver. Events were drastically impacted by COVID, um, but what wasn't was was individual giving, which actually increased, uh, mm. and we saw that across the, the industry. So making long-term strategic plans for what those goals are for each of those revenue streams. So maybe it's to decrease dependency in one and increase in, uh, you know the, your efforts in another. Um, and with then that's again your decision of where you drive your time, energy, and resources should be, um, you know, uh, 
comparative and qualitative to, to the, the, the portion of the piece of the pie, right? So. I'm, I'm going to take us to close here and thank yous. Um, but uh, before I do, one question we had, two questions. One, I just went back to some of the slides to share with folks who were saying, please go back to the exceed further slide with the boxes or the tiles, I guess is what they meant. Um, but um, someone else asking about it, how I didn't get to answer the poll on the consultation. So just drop a note in the questions box. And in fact, when we're done here today, we're gonna leave this live for a little bit uh, so that you can go ahead and enter any questions because we'll be getting back with you if you wish. Um, but it's not a sales pitch. It's really just a consultation. And when we have a phrase around here, we say, we're with you for good. Doesn't mean we're following you around. It means we're here to help you get uh, you know, to where you wanna get in terms of achieving your mission. So whatever you need help with, uh, we've been doing this for decades and that's really, you know, that's who we are. And so we're happy to help in any way we can. Uh, to that end, I'm going to go around to our uh, terrific panel here and give them a chance to say their thank yous. There any final thoughts about sort of the questions and, and maybe tying it back to the fears that we heard at the beginning? Um, and then just, uh, you know, passing along from there. But we have contact information there. And again, you'll be receiving a recording of the full presentation, no matter of when uh, you had to drop or didn't at, at any point. So I'm going to start uh, with my thank yous, which are, you know, obviously, Chris, uh, thanking you every, all the time for all of your involvement and everything that you do to contribute to our, to our uh, helping our clients. But, you know, particularly pointing out Amanda uh, Rehues, uh, CEO and President of Boys and Girls Clubs of Greater Salt Lake. You are such a giving person. You are such an expert when it comes to these uh, terrific bits of, of advice and, and you're so gracious in sharing this with the community. So thank you for joining us. I'm gonna turn it over to you to do your thank yous and final thoughts. Yeah, sure, of course. Thank you to, to you, David, and, and, and to you, Chris. And I appreciate you uh, uh, inviting me to be with you and share share my success. But I also appreciate your, your dedication to making sure my campaign was a success I, I can't tell you what that areva definitely takes that um that that commitment to customer satisfaction um you know to heart and and it doesn't stop and so we we use that for our campaign for our, where everything landed uh you know i know you guys were committed to making that successful and and pulling that off in a very short window of time so i appreciate that Kind of final thoughts tying back to those fears, right? Of, of what what did we see? You know, um, time management goals, um, board engagement, fear. I think when we set up those things, we spent a lot of time at the beginning talking about the what and the who. I think because if you can do um, all of that work into making those data driven decisions, uh, going from again that scatter shot to the laser target, you take away that fear. You take away the un uncertainty. You've got a plan and a roadmap of where you're going to go, and it's just about implementing that and then engaging your board members and giving them their tools that they need to succeed. And, and it can it can really help um, alleviate a lot of those fears. You just got to know, have the roadmap to get there. And that's what those gift calculators are, the prospect tracking, your, all that, that work you put into qualifying your donors um, just get, makes it so that you're making informed decisions um, and not just shooting from the hip, if you will. Terrific. Well, thank you again. And uh, Chris, I'll let you uh, I'll let you close us out today. Thank you, David, for setting this up and, and, and managing it and, and presenting it to all. To, and thanks to everybody for attending. But the biggest thanks goes to you, Amanda. I mean, we're all lucky to have you here and, and sharing your insights and your wisdom. Amanda is a rock star. She's being modest. I mean, honestly, she Amanda, you stepped into your your role, right? And, and how many weeks did you have to execute on this campaign? And, and you beat your goal and made more money than you ever had there i mean you she's she's been very modest about about the the campaign that she set up in a very short period of time and executed and did an amazing job and and, had, and her sharing the insights here is is, is just is so valuable so thanks amanda and sharing that the, the that board toolkit yeah. is huge as well so thanks for offering that new generosity and thanks to everybody yeah, for joining yeah, again you all You'll all be receiving a recorded video afterwards, as well as uh, anything else that we choose to send along, because there's been a lot of requests for certain things here. Uh, I am going to tell you that if you have any questions that are very specific, we're going to leave this live for just a, about maybe a, a minute or two. As we close out, I'm going to just uh, play an Ariva uh, informational video that gives you a little bit of the overview that I ran through rapid fire for your pleasure. And uh, if you have those questions, let us know. But I want to tell everyone, thank you for joining us. And uh, stay safe, stay healthy.